Electoral Commission briefed the media on important aspects of the election's timetable in the run-up to Election Day. The briefing covered issues pertaining to special vote applications, a list of voting stations, notification to vote out of country, and a breakdown of the candidates contesting in the 2024 national and provincial elections. 70 political parties and 11 independent candidates were published as final contestants for the May 29th polls. The Commission also touched on its constitutional court's appeal against the order of the electoral court. The call for Commissioner Love um, uh, to resign, uh, it's, a not, it's not a matter that um, uh, the Commission has looked at, neither has um, Commissioner Love uh, looked at the matter. So, um, personally, um, you know, absent any substantive um, evidential material establishing misconduct on the side of Commissioner Love, then there would be no basis uh, for such a resignation. Now, with respect to the Constitutional Court appeal, <clears throat> it is preferable to lodge an appeal when you have reasons because then you can follow the, the reasoning of the uh, court against which you, whose uh, orders you are appealing. But when an appeal is lodged, it's lodged against the orders of court, not against the judgment. And we have orders in this case, and on the basis of those orders, we think that there's a need for clarity on, on a number of issues. One, did the Commission go beyond its scope of authority in invoking Section 47.1e? We have no clarity as a country on that aspect at the moment. Two, did Commissioner Love prejudge the issue to extend that she ought to have recused themselves, herself. Rather. We don't know whether the statement that he made in response to a media question did in fact constitute prejudging the issue. Does remission of sentence amount to the reduction of the sentence as ordered by a court of law. We don't know. So those questions have to be answered for the clarity of everybody in respect of the uh, immediate case, but also in respect of future, future elections. SABC News reporter Natasha Piri attended the briefing and joins us live. Good afternoon, Natasha. Perhaps you can give us more details in terms of the progress the IEC is making in its preparations for the May 29th elections. Well, thank you so much, Nastasha. We do know that we are 42 days away from uh, the critical elections um, that will be taking place on the 29th of May. Of course, other important issues coming out there is that 70 political parties and 11 independent candidates will be contesting the national and uh, provincial polls. It's also quite important, especially in terms of voter education, the IEC taking us through the make and designs of the ballot papers. Remember, this time around, there will be three ballot papers, the national, which is going to be a two-column ballot paper, and that is where uh, political parties will be vying for seats only. Then you have the regionals to national, where independent candidates and political parties will be contesting for those 200 seats. And of course, the last but not least um, is the provincial ballots, where uh, political parties and independent candidates will be contesting for various seats um, in uh, the provincial legislatures across uh, the nine provinces in the country. And just the IEC updating us about, uh, you know, voting special votes as well and those who will be voting overseas is co of course for special votes if you're interested in that uh, you need to apply now the deadline is the third of may and um 
special votes will be taking place two days before um, the May uh, 29 polls, which is on the 27th and on the 28th. But of course, the IEC also addressing the elephant in the room. Last week, we saw the IEC there approaching the Constitutional Court on an urgent basis to appeal the order of the Electoral Court. You would remember that last week, Tuesday, Electoral Court overturned the IEC's decision or that objection to bar former President Jacob Zuma from running as a candidate in Parliament, also addressing issues of the ballot that indeed his face will be on the ballot. And um, the IEC just basically saying, I mean, we've been hearing people and critics, the MK party saying that the IEC has actually overreached in this case. Why do they actually need to take their issue um, to the apex court? But the IEC here is saying that they actually need a legal clarity on this issue, especially when it comes to section 47.1e of um, the constitution. Um, very important what the CEO um, had actually said during this briefing that they have the orders in this case, but there is a need for clarity. They still don't have the reasons from the electoral court. And to talk us more through this, we're joined by the IEC's uh, DCO, Mr. Mawe to Mazri. But Mazri, thank you so much for joining us on SABC News. So you've clarified during the briefing that, listen, in terms of the decision of the electoral court, you have the orders, but there's a need for clarity because you still don't have the reasons. That is uh, correct, Natasha, and the viewers. Uh, basically, the outcome uh, or in terms of the order of the court leaves a number of constitutional questions. And once they are constitutional questions, it's the apex court, which is the constitutional court that must give uh, the clarity, the understanding that is desirable. In both the matters that were ordered last week, uh, the matter on uh, Section 47 and the matter on uh, uh, honorable consulates mm -hmm. in, in, for voting outside of the country, those need further clarification. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've noted uh, appeals in both of those matters. I like the fact that you also speak about um, those who will be voting outside of the country. So is, my understanding is that um, the IEC will now have to extend or add more voting stations overseas, especially in this issue of Sydney in Australia. Those um, voters who are supposed to travel from Perth to Canberra, and I understand that it takes uh, over 30 hours to actually get to that place. If you'll just, um, you know, educate us and educate those who are probably in Perth watching us right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, we, we've been alert to the travel that uh, uh, out-of-country voters have had to go through in the past uh, and previous elections. And uh, part of our introduction of uh, online voter registration was also assisting them not to travel those distances twice for registration and voting. And we expected them that they will plan for the election itself. Now, there are a few uh, nuances in this matter. Uh, you can only hold uh, elections within a territory of your jurisdiction as a country. And we, it, it is of interest whether an honorary consulate has such territory and therefore it raises issues of international law and the various conventions around this on what would be regarded as a territory of South Africa in Australia for us to be able to conduct an election. But we are not the authority on that or the mandated institution for that. It is indeed our Department of International Relations who are mandated for that. So we will take a cue from them on what is possible. Okay. Mr. Mansuri, thank you so much for your time. I actually had more questions, but unfortunately, studio <laughs> is asking me to wrap for the purposes of time. So, Nastasha, of course, we've addressed that elephant in the room. And also another one is, um, of course, uh, those South Africans that are actually voting out of uh, the country.